Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Hello and welcome to Focus on Health. I'm your host Peggy Mello. Today's guest is Dr. G. Kirk Gleason, a dentist from Clifton Park. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, Peggy. Uh, why don't we start out by um, having you talk about your practice and uh, what kind of background you have for education. Well, I'm a, I'm a general dentist. I practice in Clifton Park with uh, two younger dentists. And I've been there for 30 years. Um, very involved in the community as well as the dental community. I've, uh, I've held many positions in the dental society including the National Trustee from New York of the American Dental Association and now I am the executive director of the 4th District Dental Society which is basically the represents all the dentists from the Mohawk River north to Canada, about 400 dentists. And here in Colony, uh, Colony is in the 3rd District Dental Society, about the, just, uh, about the same number of dentists, slightly more, and um, all part of the New York State Dental Society and ultimately the American Dental Association. Okay. And um, just so our viewers understand, how does a dentist become a dentist? Where do they go to school? What do they have to get? Well, generally you have uh, four years of college with uh, an emphasis on science, and then you have four years of dental school. So it's exactly the same amount of training as any, any other kind of doctor. And then you uh, usually have one to two years of extra training, and then you practice uh, general dentistry. If you're going to become a specialist in orthodontics or oral surgery or periodontics, you'll have another two to three years of training before you start working. But general dentists um, do all different phases of dentistry, including all of the specialties, but then they refer to specialists when it's appropriate. Okay. Um, now, about the dental society, now you said Colony is the third dental society of New York State. Um, it's the third can, district, yes. Okay, the third district. Uh, what can people call the dental society for? Well, um, there's an office right here uh, in the area. There's also a, a very excellent website for the Third District Dental Society, and you can go to that website to find out all kinds of answers to questions about dentistry. Mm -hmm. They will also help you find a dentist. Uh, they can recommend dentists uh, depending upon your locale, and um, they will also link you to both the State Society and the American Dental Association for broader or other questions in that way. Okay. So people should make note of that, definitely. Yes, and, and dentists, and in New York, uh, more than 75% of all the practicing dentists belong to the Dental Society. So the Dental Society truly represents the dental community, and there's a very close relationship between the dentists, and they help each other out as much as possible, and they are trying very hard to do great for the public. Good. Okay, you have brought quite a number of models today. <laughs> um, would you like to demonstrate with some of those models uh, about the anatomy of the teeth in a person's mouth? Well, sure. You asked me to. What do we want to start with? Well, I'll, I'll just hold a couple things up. This is an oversized model of a tooth. It, uh, it's a tooth that happens to have periodontal disease, but, mm -hmm. but you can see that the, there's a crown portion of the tooth, and there's the root portion of the tooth, which is down in the bone and the gum. Mm -hmm. uh, if we take a look at a model that shows a cutaway portion, I want you to also realize that in the middle of the tooth is a hollow space, and that's where the nerve and blood vessels are of the tooth. Okay. Because a tooth is a living, healthy organism that you have to take care of just like any other part of your body. And you have to uh, protect this nerve so that it doesn't have a problem. Okay. And now we talk about, uh, you want to show the mouth the full mouth view and sure. show the teeth in there. Well, I, I just brought a simple oversized model that we use in our office to demonstrate toothbrushing and things like that. But I think everybody knows we have upper and lower teeth and you have 32 teeth and unless you've had your wisdom teeth removed. You have okay. molars in the back and incisors in the front. And uh, 
we talked about uh, how to brush your teeth or how to clean them well. And using this model, one good way to, I, I can't show you how to brush your teeth like this, but I'll, I'll mention a couple things you should think about. Every single tooth has five surfaces. There's okay. the tongue surface, the cheek surface, the biting surface, and then the two surfaces on the front and the back. And you need to clean all those surfaces of every single tooth. Mm -hmm. So uh, perhaps brushing in circles would be very helpful if you were to start on the upper right and do the outside of all of the teeth and then the inside of all the teeth on the top, then the biting surface of those, that's three circles. The same thing on the bottom, brushing carefully on the outside, mm -hmm. the inside, and then the biting surface, and then of course flossing between all of the teeth and, and rinsing well sometimes with an antiseptic mouthwash. It's very, very helpful. And don't forget to brush the tongue because there's the lots tongue. of plaque on the tongue. Okay, and what sort or types of toothbrushes do you recommend? Well, I think um, recently some of the mechanical toothbrushes have become so good that in my office we recommend that most people consider buying a good mechanical toothbrush. There are different kinds. Uh, I brought along a, a very popular one. It's called Sonicare. Okay. It, it's a little bit more expensive. I mean, there are some very inexpensive ones in the drugstore with little batteries in them and, and they work okay. But some of these more expensive ones do work very, very well because of the way they vibrate. And by turning this on, you can hear it buzz, a very high pitched buzz. And okay. as you run it across your teeth at the gum line, it vibrates in a very high speed and helps remove the plaque. And it, uh, we find people that use a good mechanical toothbrush are simply healthier than ones that are brushing on their own. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean you can't brush on your own uh, with uh, any kind of toothbrush. I'm not advocating it has to be Colgate, but I'm showing you this is a soft toothbrush. Colgate makes them, Crest makes them, many different companies make them. If you're buying your toothbrush, always buy a soft toothbrush because it's very important that the bristles bend along the gum line in order to reach under the gum and in between the teeth to clean. Okay. And you want to change your toothbrush probably every three months at the most. If the bristles start going off in different directions, throw it away and get a new toothbrush. Uh, I'm not saying that you can't brush well with this and everybody should have a mechanical toothbrush. But what I am saying is the hygienist, my staff, and the other dentists in my office all use mechanical toothbrushes. Even though we can brush great with one of these, we find even we do better with a good mechanical toothbrush. Okay. So let's talk about cleanings. Um, how often should a person go to the dentist um, and get a checkup? Well, the general standard is that... Uh, People should go to the dentist twice a year for a, a cleaning and an examination. Uh, and that's children, adults, uh, seniors. Uh, generally, that is true. Okay. There are exceptions. There are a few people that are in perfect health and can go um, maybe once a year, but I don't find that to be very often. Most people really greatly benefit from a twice a year checkup. And there are some people that need to go more often, especially people that have had periodontal disease or periodontal problems, we often see them four times a year. And even if insurance doesn't cover two of those visits or they have to pay for it, it's probably the best money they could ever spend. Mm -hmm. So how often should x-rays be done uh, and what type of x-rays are they? Well, dentists basically take two kinds of x-rays. Um, there's the bite wing x-rays, which are the ones we use to detect cavities in between the back teeth. And generally, we take those every two years on healthy people. Um, if someone, some teenagers, some people that have had more cavities, sometimes we take those more often, but we selectively choose that. That's really up to the dentist to decide if, if mm -hmm. more than two years is appropriate, uh, and it sometimes is on, on some people. And then there's a, a Panorex x-ray that uh, many dentists use, which is a one picture that shows all of your teeth in, in one shot, and it's not really used to detect cavities. It's only taken about every five years, but it, it's very important to show uh, cysts and bone problems and things that uh, we need to be concerned about, and we find every so often on something like that. Uh, some dentists don't have a Panorex x-ray machine, and they take what's known as a full series, which are little individual shots of all of the different teeth as well, and, and that's an excellent survey of the teeth. But those aren't taken all of the time. Those would be taken uh, maybe ever four, every four or five years. Okay. Now, there are also patients that are taking medications that get certain 
uh, results or side effects from the medications that affect their teeth. Can you explain how that happens? Well, that, that's certainly true. Um, and, and the biggest group that we are concerned about are the uh, seniors or older, older Americans because as they start to take more and more medications, it often affects either the makeup of the saliva or the dryness of their mouth and makes them often uh, more prone to decay. But there, you know, there are many different medications that uh, affect the mouth, and that's why it's so important to tell your dentist all the medications that you're on is very helpful when you come in. If you're taking a number of medications, they have a list that you can just hand to them or her. And, uh, and that, that's very helpful as we prescribe treatment. Okay. So let's say somebody actually goes for their checkup and, and here's the bad news that they have a cavity. Um, how do you find the cavities and how do you treat the cavities? Well, both hygienists and dentists do careful examinations uh, of the patient's mouth when we, when we have a checkup. And uh, we look at every surface of the tooth and we feel every surface of the tooth. and um, Large cavities are very easy for a professional to see, but small ones can also be found using a, a small pick or something. It doesn't hurt, and we want to find the cavities when they're small. Cavities almost always grow. If you ignore a cavity, it almost okay. always gets bigger, mm -hmm. and at some point, left untreated, it almost always affects the nerve of the tooth, causing much bigger problems, either the loss of the tooth or at the least endodontic or root canal treatment on the tooth. Yeah. So it's very important to go for checkups, find cavities early, and fix them when they're small so they don't get bigger. Now obviously the okay. cavity detection x-rays that we were talking about are used to find cavities in between the teeth because we can't visually see those until they get really big and we want to find those when they're small right. and also take care of them. So if the dentist finds a small cavity, I guess you can be upset if you want, but you should be happy that he found it or she found it when it was small because it can be fixed then and it doesn't cause a bigger problem for you. Now, talking about the cavities between the teeth, do you, does, does flossing have any effect on prevention of those cavities? Well, flossing is the number, way, well, number one way to prevent that type of decay because your toothbrush, no matter what toothbrush it is, can't really reach the surfaces where the two teeth are tight together. Okay. And flossing is the, really the only thing that gets in there and disrupts the plaque that everybody gets in that area. Uh, the other thing we always want to consider is what causes those kind of cavities. And when we get cavities in between the teeth, it's almost always caused by some type of sugary liquid that is uh, getting into those spaces that we're not getting out and we need to be very careful about that. Now, what kind of examples would you give of, of liquids, sugary liquids that people should be um, well, besides, wary of? Besides the obvious liquids, obviously gum with sugar in it, cough drops, or any kind of, you know, even Tic Tacs that aren't sugar-free, uh, that we don't think much about, put sugar in your saliva, and for the next 20 minutes, all the plaque in your mouth changes that into acid and dumps it on the teeth. And over a long period of time, mm. that weakens the enamel and causes decay. But the other liquid that uh, we're very concerned about these days are, are all of the sports drinks okay. and a lot, and of course, soda uh, right. that has sugar in it. But, you know, okay, a lot of we see a lot of teenage for teenagers, for example, that have never had any problems, but teenagers and young adults are coming in with all kinds of cavities in between their teeth. And the common denominator in almost every case is that, oh, well, I'm, I'm just drinking some Gatorade, um, you know, every half hour while I'm doing sports or some other type of uh, sports drink that has sugar in it or, or Mountain Dew or Coke or something with sugar in it on, on a regular basis, and okay. that's what's causing the problem. Okay, so you've already mentioned a couple of things about prevention. Um, the sugary drinks is one of the things, but what else can we do or use um, to prevent, to have good dental health, basically? Well, obviously, you need to have good oral hygiene. So you need to brush and floss carefully uh, on a regular basis. So you should certainly floss every day, and you should uh, brush um, after meals if possible, but certainly in the morning and before you go to bed. Um, you want to be careful what you're, you know, all the things that are healthy for us to eat, fruits and vegetables, et cetera, are also 
healthy for your teeth in generally. Uh, you want to prevent uh, or you want to try not to have any liquids or candies or things that are going to linger and put liquid in your mouth over a long period of time. And it's not, okay. it's not the amount, it's the frequency. So one sip of soda 10 times a day is far worse than drinking a liter of soda once a day. So uh, drinking coffee with sugar on it and, in it and sipping it many times a day, you better floss because that sugar is going in between your teeth and causing mm. problems. Okay. Now, what about our young patients and prevention? Uh, what can be done? Is it is it fluoride that's an issue with them, or um, what should be, what should be done for younger patients? Well, let's talk about fluoride for a second because fluoride is a is a word that um, means many different things. There are fluoride vitamins and the fluoride in certain municipal water supplies, mm -hmm. and that is very important for children under ten because the small amount of fluoride item, um, ion that's introduced between uh, birth and 10 is incorporated into the teeth as they are forming down underneath the gums. And so when they come out, the permanent teeth come out and are used, they're much harder. The enamel is harder because of that fluoride. Okay. Then you have the fluoride in toothpaste and you have the fluoride that the dentist puts on um, most children when they have a checkup that is flowing onto the teeth that are already into the mouth and making those teeth harder. So it's all fluoride, it all is very helpful in preventing decay, but we're talking about different things. So fluoride vitamins don't do anything after say age 10 okay. when the enamel of all the teeth have formed. But up until that point, or the, you don't take fluoride vitamins if there's fluoride in the water. and. And around the Capital District, there's fluoride in some water supplies and, and not in others, and oh. you should be aware of that. There's also uh, fluoride in, and then a lot of people are using bottled water instead of municipal water to drink all the time. And if you have from a place that has yes. fluoride in the water, but you only give your child bottled water that doesn't have fluoride in it, you're not getting any of those benefits. So then maybe you should be thinking about fluoride vitamins. Now I'm confused because I think there's bottled water that's spring water and there's bottled water that's municipal water that's purified, right? So right. you're talking about just the spring water? Well, I'm talking about most bottled water doesn't okay. have fluoride in it. Okay. So, uh, and so if you are, would normally get some fluoride if you're a child from drinking tap water mm -hmm. and you never drink tap water because your parents are always giving you bottled water, then you're not getting the benefit of the fluoride. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. All right. Now, what about uh, periodontal disease? Do you want to define what that is and um, how to treat it? Well, besides cavities, the other thing we worry about the most is periodontal disease. And, and that's the uh, disease that affects the gum and the bone that holds the teeth in. It's generally caused by a lot of the same things that cause cavities the uh, bacteria and plaque in our mouth. And so that, that's why I said you want to use a soft toothbrush that bends down underneath the gum line to remove that plaque under the gum line because okay. you want the gum line to be healthy at all times. If your gums bleed, they're not healthy. You should be able to brush your, all of your teeth and not have any bleeding. And okay. if they are, you should be telling your dentist about that and uh, he should be working with you to make sure that does not happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and periodontal disease, you know, we can fix cavities, but when periodon periodontal disease is around for a while and uh, the bone goes away that holds the teeth in, then we run out of ways of fixing them. So it's very important to prevent periodontal disease. Hmm. Also, there's uh, the research recently has demonstrated that there's a large correlation between periodontal disease and stroke and heart attacks. And there is also a uh, correlation between periodontal disease and the birth of healthy children. So we greatly encourage any pregnant woman to make sure that her gums are very healthy and, and get in and see the dentist and make sure that happens. There appears to be a direct link between low birth weight and periodontal okay. disease and uh, stroke and heart attack. There's a, definitely a, a direct link. And of course, smoking is a huge factor here. Oh, uh, okay. Most people, most people that have severe periodontal disease are also smokers. Not always, but 
it greatly ups your risk factor if you're a smoker. Does, does smoking add more plaque to your teeth, or what exactly does it do to the mouth? Well, scientifically, it's hard for me to tell you what it, what it does. I can tell you there's a great correlation, whether it's the heat, the tar, the nicotine, or how it affects other parts of your body or your bloodstream, but uh, people that smoke tend to have a lot more periodontal problems. Mm. Now, we great, most dentists work very hard to encourage their patients not to smoke, just not because of periodontal disease, but because of all of the, the healthy things that it will help them with for all of their life if they don't smoke, obviously. Right. Okay, so next we talk about the dreaded pain in the dentist's office. Um, how does a dentist try to prevent that, um, just basically keeping people comfortable? Well, almost everything that we do in dentistry today is generally pain-free. Uh, if we have to do a procedure in your mouth that requires uh, drilling a tooth or removing decay or things like that, we, we use uh, anesthesia to make you numb, and, and that can be given almost painlessly in most cases, so that it would be very unusual to have any procedure done today where you feel anything and uh, you should insist that it be pain-free and uh, make sure your dentist does that. Um, I'm not saying that you can't ever have sensitivity. You can. Some people are more sensitive, have, are more sensitive during cleanings than others. But, you know, there are topical anesthetics. There's all kinds of things that can be used even to prevent those kind of problems. So generally, dentis dentistry should be pain-free. And if you're experiencing a lot of pain, I'd, uh, I think I'd have a discussion with your dentist because he can always, he or she can almost always make it pain free. Hmm. Okay. Now there's another topic that I think has been extremely popular in the last 10 years or so, which is infection control. You know, there's a lot of the antibacterial wipes and things like that. Uh, what should a dentist's office do to uh, keep bacteria out of the environment? Well, you know, the Dental Society and the New York State Dental Association are very serious about infection control, and the state itself, uh, the health department and the education department, has very strict guidelines and mandates that all dentists have to follow. Every dentist in New York State has to uh, take a, a very serious infection control continuing education course every four years as a requirement for their license. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, we all follow what's known as universal precautions, which means we assume that every patient that comes in the office has hepatitis or AIDS or something wrong with them. They okay. generally do not, but we have to assume that. And that's why we uh, sterilize any instrument that goes into the mouth or use a disposable one, which is a one-time use of that instrument. Mm -hmm. We all wear gloves, masks, and glasses uh, to not only uh, protect the patient, but to protect the dentist from the patient. And then, uh, now, please understand that a dental office cannot be sterile the way an operating room perhaps might be, because we're working in the mouth, and there's all kinds of germs already in the mouth. We're mm -hmm. not working in a sterile part of the body. But what we do between every single patient is wipe down every surface that has been touched or used in any way with disinfectant solutions, and so generally, a, an operatory or where we work is very clean and then we try very hard okay. not to contaminate that as we work but please it's not an operating room it's a clean area so anything that goes in the mouth or goes under the gum or is used for surgery that's all sterilized um, right. but but you know the, the light and all the things we touch are carefully wiped down and and disinfected between every patient, but it, it's not a sterile environment the way a uh, operating room is. But th that doesn't make any difference. People are extremely safe in a dental office. Uh, the chance of any problem in there is very small. Okay. Now, what about cosmetic dentistry? Let's say people want to have an absolutely gorgeous smile. Uh, what, what can they have done at a dentist's office that can help them? Well, you know, uh, the number of things that we can do to help patients with their smile has, has blossomed and ballooned, and uh, we really have many techniques and things that we can do to help people, uh, whether it's orthodontics to straighten out their teeth or teeth whitening or bleaching that makes their teeth whiter. Uh, mm -hmm. And then there are 
wonderful cosmetic procedures like veneers and porcelain crowns and things like that. Most dentists today are using uh, tooth colored or white fillings in virtually every case. Um, amalgam is still a viable filling that is used in certain instances in certain places, but I can tell you the latest research I have seen is that the number of uh, silver fillings placed in the United States is probably under 15 to 20 percent now when it used to be 80 to 90 percent. And that, that is because the, the new composites and the tooth color fillings are, are wonderful. They look great and that's what the patients want. So we can do many things. It, it just depends on what your needs are and also sometimes certain procedures can be quite expensive if you want to have porcelain crowns or porcelain veneers on all of your teeth you know that is going to be a costly procedure okay. but most people can look and feel much healthier just by uh, making sure their teeth don't have stain on them that they're relatively straight that the fillings uh, don't show when they smile and uh, and if they want to whiten everybody likes whiter teeth and that's great it's quite safe and works well so do the the self um, whitening kits do they actually work some of them are getting better. My, my unscientific guess is that they work about half as well as what the dentist can do for you. All right. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I was wondering. So uh, next, why don't we talk about um, dental implants? What exactly are they and, and how, how are they put in? Well, I'm sure everyone's heard about dental implants and they're a wonderful new way that allows dentists to replace teeth without having to touch and do anything with other teeth in the mouth. And they basically are a, a titanium um, root, let's, about the size of a root, made out of titanium with a special coating on them that the surgeon places into the bone and the gum where there are missing teeth. And then the general dentist or the prosthodontist can build on top of that titanium root that's now in your jawbone, mm -hmm. uh, a crown or a bridge work or other things. It is, it's wonderful in replacing single teeth so that you don't have to touch the teeth on either side. Sometimes, what we always did in the past was we did a bridge. So we might put a crown on the teeth of, on either side of that space and a false crown in the middle which is permanently cemented in place to replace a single missing tooth. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that still is the best procedure, especially if you already have crowns on those teeth or they have great big fillings in them and they would benefit from crowns. But, but in lots of the instances where there's not much wrong with the teeth on either side, now we have the wonderful option of being able to place an implant that then has a crown on it and you have a full complement of teeth again without having to touch the teeth on either side. Hmm. The other time that uh, implants, and implants can be used not just for a single tooth, they can be used to mount a bridge on it and they feel just like your own teeth once it's all done and it's an absolutely wonderful surface f service for people that have dentures, dentures, especially lower dentures. Anyone that has a lower denture knows that it, it's a very difficult appliance to get along with and generally does not feel like your own teeth used to feel. Mm -hmm. You put up with it, some people do pretty well, some people do not do well. And if you take those same people and you place perhaps just two implants about in the areas where the canines are, maybe more, but even just two, and then something in the denture is fixed to attach to those implant, then your lower denture, instead of moving around with your tongue and all of the ways that it does, now clicks down on top of those anchors and becomes a very stable and comfortable thing in your mouth, and it's a wonderful surface service for people that have dentures that are moving around all the time. Does it still mean that uh, the people with lower dentures, do they still need um the actual fixative or no? Well, if you, you wouldn't need the fixative if you had implants that support the denture. Okay. Sometimes you don't even have to have a new denture. Sometimes you can have, if you have a good denture, uh, the surgeon can place two implants in there and then the, the dent, general dentist will um, drill out a little bit of the underside of those dentures and place a very special atta attachment that then fits over the top of the little part of the implant that's sticking up in it clicks down into place and, and, and people are just so happy with that. In fact, mm. we tell people 
in our own practice, if in reality they are at the point where they have to have a denture, they're going to lose whatever remaining teeth they have and they have to have a denture, okay. we tell them, we want you to think in terms of an implant retained denture. Don't just think of a denture. Maybe we start with a denture, but then we put the implants in and get it in. Of course, it does cost more. That's what I was about to ask. <laughs> well, it's, it does cost it more, costs? but it's, it's really worth it for anyone that can afford it. And two implants like that with the denture, uh, I, I hate to quote fees. Uh, generally, an implant, uh, a single implant, could be anywhere from... Fourteen hundred dollars to two thousand okay. dollars, but um, when you're attaching a denture to it, the additional cost is not very great. Uh, when you're doing a implant with a crown on top of it, it it costs uh, a little bit more than a regular crown because there's some very special laboratory things that have to be done. But uh, I find people that want implants, uh, they don't they don't care. That's what they want. And, and it's a wonderful service, and they appear, appear to be very safe, and it appears that they're going to last for a very long time. Uh, there are some dental researchers saying that uh, they may last longer than your own teeth. So mm -hmm. uh, we have great success with implants and the things you put on top of them. Okay, and those can be done by any generally practicing dentists or well, generally, specialists? Uh, general dentists usually do the part of the dentistry that places the crowns or bridges or things on top of the implant. Mm -hmm. uh, oral surgeons and periodontists and other dentists are generally the ones that place the, the surgical part that places the implant in the jaw. But it's not a, fa a painful procedure, whether you, uh, they might put you to sleep for it or they can do it with just Novocaine and it won't hurt you. Um, and, it, and once that implant is in there, there is a period of time you have to wait until uh, the other part is done, but once it's done, there's no pain. And, and the part that the general dentist does in the end, although it's tricky and intricate on his part and requires some real skill to do things right, mm -hmm. you almost always can do it without Novocaine. There's no pain at all associated with that once the implant is in. Now, there are a few dentists that do both the surgery and the implant, and they've been specially trained to do so. I mean, surgery, implant, and the crown and bridge or whatever you put on top of it. But generally, the surgeon, some surgeon, periodontist or oral surgeon, places the implant and works closely as okay. a team member with the general dentist to then complete the restoration. Okay. All right, next is root canals. Can you describe what a root canal is, how you do it, basically? Sure. Let me, uh, let me hold up my little model again. Okay. Okay. And this was the model that we used before that's a cutaway section of a tooth. Mm -hmm. And this red area right here is the nerve inside the tooth. And in fact, on this model, this, these little brown things represent cavities. Okay. Now, they're not very deep, but if this cavity were to go down and get into the nerve, okay. or you get a crack that goes into the nerve, or you have a trauma, a blow, or something that causes the nerve to die, once the nerve is irreversibly damaged, you have two choices. You can take the tooth out, or you can often do a root canal. And what, what's done is the dentist makes a little hole in the top of the tooth with anesthesia so you don't feel anything, then goes in and removes the contaminated or infected nerve from the middle of the tooth, and then fills that space up with an inert filling material. And then um, the tooth stays in the mouth as a, a normal tooth with no nerve in it. So, so a root canal tooth is mean, dead, basically. Well, the tooth still has fibers that come into it from the outside. The nerve is no longer there, but I wouldn't say the tooth is dead. Mm -hmm. But uh, we almost always then put a, a cap or a crown on a tooth that's had a root canal just because many of them have had very large fillings. Sometimes they become a little more brittle, and in order to pre prevent breakage, you do that. But it means you keep your own tooth. and. Uh, so it's a very excellent procedure. Sometimes you can't do a root canal. Uh, the decay is too bad or there's a crack or a fracture. Then sometimes you have to lose the tooth and then you would consider an implant. But if you can do a root canal, they are almost always successful and work very well. I mean, I, I have a couple of my own mouth that are 40 years old with crowns on them that work great. Excellent. So. Okay, lastly is prosthodontics. I had to learn what that meant. <laughs> uh, caps and bridges, can you um, define what they are and how they work? Well, we talked a little bit about veneers and porcelain crowns. A crown and a cap are the same thing. 
uh, a veneer a veneer is something that just goes over the front half of the tooth. You often do have to cut the tooth some in order to place them. Okay. There are some veneers that can go on without having to cut the tooth at all, but um, it, it just depends on your situation. Uh, and, then, and then you have many teeth that have lots of fillings in them or are twisted or shaped wrong or something where a simple veneer is not going to solve the problem, especially in, in the back part of the mouth. And most of us do crowns or caps on molars more than anything else that we do. Okay. And it's because we have a wonderful adult population that now have all of their teeth, unlike a couple generations ago, but those teeth have a lot of fillings or they get brittle or they get cracked or they break or whatever. And we run out of ways of filling them with simple fillings. So then we put a crown or a cap on the tooth. And if, if you can think of, a crown is simply like a very strong filling that fits over the entire, the, of the entire crown portion of the tooth. And we take out all okay. the, uh, you know, if we look at this model, the crown portion of the tooth is this part of the tooth. And in order, if this had a lot of fillings in it, we might uh, take out all the old fillings and the outer covering of enamel, and we'd have something that looks like a fat thimble still sticking up. All the roots and everything are still there, so most of your tooth is still there. It's your own tooth, mm -hmm. but you don't have this top part on here. And then we take impressions of that. We make a temporary crown. The laboratory then makes a, a real crown that fits. Then uh, you come back and we take off the temporary and put a permanent crown on top of that. Most of them are uh, gold and palladium or metal on the inside and porcelain on the outside. There certainly are a lot these days that are all porcelain because the technique of doing it with all porcelain and bonding is certainly working well in many instances. But either way, it's covering the entire tooth and therefore, and it has strength in itself so you can't really break it. Okay. And it works well and looks like your own tooth, feels like your own tooth. And if it doesn't fit perfectly when you get it, you can make adjustments, right? You know, the impression materials today are so good that if the dentist carefully prepares the tooth for a crown and takes a good impression, the laboratory almost always can make a crown that fits very well. Okay. But the dentist is going to try it in and make sure I mean, I have a wonderful laboratory that does superior work, but I still have to make very minor adjustments on most crowns when I put them in to make sure that the bite is just right, that the contact is just right, and that the, the margins fit as they should along the gum line. And dentists will check all of those things, and if it isn't right, they will have it fixed or remade or whatever because they want to put crowns in that fit and look perfectly, fit right, and feel good. Okay. All right, I think we covered everything. Um, it's possible. Anything else you want to mention or well, everything? You know, I, what I, I certainly would like to say is that uh, dentistry is a, a profession now that is, is really fun to practice. And it's because Americans have become much more aware of their teeth. They're interested in having a healthy and nice smile. Um, most people that we see have generally healthy mouths and so it's become a lot more fun to help people feel better about themselves and look better and, and that's really nice. Uh, we need young people to look at dentistry as one of the professions that they might choose if they have an aptitude mm -hmm. and I hope they will. Uh, and dentists are um, uh, by all by all surveys, uh, one of the more respected professions uh, to the general public. Uh, we work very hard. It's, it's the only profession that's trying to put itself out of business in that we work very hard with our patients to try and prevent all of their problems. We still have plenty of right. work, but we're trying very hard to help them have healthier mouths. And in fact, um, just in the short time that I practice, which has been 30 years, uh, I've gone from having to put out lots of fires every single day and seeing people with toothaches and abscesses and doing that to mm -hmm. now generally many of the things that I do are helping people have better smiles, look better, feel better, and feel better about themselves. And, and that makes dentistry a lot more fun. And, uh, but we really encourage people to go regularly uh, and uh, at least twice a year get a dentist that they like and there's lots of them around that are very good both men and women because uh, 
Um, right. Nowadays, half of all the graduates are women dentists, so there's lots of wonderful women dentists really? out there that are uh, are very excellent. And uh, so, find a good dentist and go regularly, and let them help you have a great smile. Well, Dr. Gleason, you're certainly a good advocate for dentistry, and I thank you very much for coming on the show. Well, thanks very much for having me. Thanks for watching. We hope to see you next time on Focus on Health.